classes and in the meantime I just want to ask everybody to stand up look for somebody you never seen before go there and tell them hello and that God loves them and stretch your legs and get ready for a really great service and please remain standing Let's all remain standing as we worship together because I'm telling you, this is the greatest day in history. It's the day that we get to worship our Lord and Savior. Jesus is alive. Come on, he's alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Come on, sing it out, happy day. Come on, he's alive. Come on, church. We have a risen Savior. It's a happy day. You can't sing about a happy day with a frown on your face. Let's get some smiles out there. Let's get excited about our Savior. And let's worship Him. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, 
I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. Yes, you are. What a glorious way that you have set me and oh what a glorious day thank you Jesus what a glorious day hallelujah Hallelujah, make some noise for Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I am changed. I am changed because of you. I'll never be the same. Amen. Woohoo. You may be seated if you can. Wow. I tell you, I don't know. Just coming to church makes me excited. Yeah. And you know what? The greatest thing about it is because my Savior lives within me, I don't even have to come to church to get excited. I can get excited wherever I am. Amen? Amen. But I love coming to church and just worshiping him corporately. Amen. I have my ushers come forward at this time. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just ask that uh, you bless this time of fellowship. Lord, that this, this would be a time that we, uh, that we forget about those that are around us. We forget about the accusations of the enemy. And Lord, we just recognize how much you love us. How much you love us in spite of what we've done and places we've been. Lord, how much you love us in spite of ourselves. And we just ask, Lord, that out of that love that we recognize you have for us, we will love you back. We will worship you. We will rest at your feet. And we'll exalt your name. In Jesus' name, amen. together. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out of me. 
That's right, Lord. Your, your love, love never fails. Your love never fails. It never gives up. Never rests out on me. Your love never fails. Never gives up. Never rides out on me. Your love. Your love. One thing remains. One thing Your love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never rides out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never rides out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never rides out on me, your love, your love. In death, in life, in death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power. Your Our church, nothing's going to take his love away. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, I just have to say something about that song that we just sang. His love never gives up. You know, it doesn't matter how many times I failed him. He still loves me. It doesn't matter how many times I, I, I've, I've started off on the right track to fall backwards. He still loves me. And, and friends, when we sing that song about His love never gives up, it never fails, it never runs out on you or me, you got to recognize the truth behind it. He loves you. Now, I don't know everything about everybody in this room, but I do know people. And according to the Word of God, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. So I don't know if you're sitting in this room or standing in this room thinking that 
you're worse than somebody else. We're all sinners. And I want to encourage you today to break out of whatever hold the enemy is, has on you. Whatever accusations that accuser is whispering in your ear and to rebuke him in the name of Jesus and worship your Savior because he loves you. A friend of mine says, kick the devil in the teeth and worship God. Let's do it. And his love has never changed. He doesn't matter how many times we fail him. His love towards us has never changed. But sometimes, and most of the time, God, he loves to see, he loves to see that we, we come to him and just say, God, I need you. He knows what we're going through. He knows that. You don't even have to tell him that, you know, it's the stuff, the storm, and everything that we're going through. Because he knows our lives. But it pleases him whenever we come to him. And then, just like my children, I know that, you know, they, they're going through something. And, and sometimes people, I know that they're hungry. I know that they're hungry. But to, to hear them, to say, Mommy... Mommy, I want a hug. Mommy, I wanna, you know, I want an egg. I just listen to my children says, "Mommy, I need this." Amen. It just bless my heart because I know, I know that they turn to me whenever they need something. And God, God loves that whenever we turn to Him. We turn to Him. That's right. I can't do this on my own. I just need you. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. And I say it on Wednesday. Make the worship, make the praise, make the prayer, make everything that we do for Him as a lifestyle. It's not whenever we need Him, not whenever Sunday or Wednesday night. Make us a life, like a lifestyle. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. And get into prayer and worship Him. Amen. And give worship Him. And Jesus, we welcome you, God. We welcome yes. you, Jesus. And Lord, we want to bless yes. your name, Jesus. Jesus. Because we love you, God. Because yes. we love you.
This is our prayer to you. We need you every hour.
Hallelujah. Make some noise for Jesus. And I don't know about you, I need Jesus every single time. And this is why I'm, I'm trying to encourage everybody to, if I say all the time, make it as a lifestyle because we can, because I can't do anything throughout the day without God's, without Jesus' guidance. And, and more we spend the time with Him, more He will give you the knowledge, the discernment, the wisdom, and the guidance that you need every single day, even to the decision that you want to make, that you will make. And I want to share something about how God's guidance and His wisdom throughout our days. Um, whenever we went on the way to the vacation one time, um, for some reason, you know, it's we left the church and we were in the interstate. I forgot which one it is, but um, it was smooth. It went really smooth. And then for some reason, again, if you spend time with God, God speaks in the still small voice that we recognize that's a God's voice. And we know that He speaks to us every single time. And that day, I was like, even though we, you know, we keep, keep going on, and I was like, no, babe, why don't we stop in the rest area? And I was like, and He was like, Really? And Pastor Glenn didn't really like to stop a lot, you know, whenever he traveled. And I was like, yeah, we need to stop in the arrest area. I don't know. I just, I just, either the kids need to get something from the thing, from the vending machine, or I just need to go to the bathroom or something like that. So, even though he was just like, oh, like grumbling. So we stopped. We stopped. And then, they didn't know what's going on that time. We stopped and we spent a little bit time at the rest area. And sure enough, whenever we left, we actually just missed the biggest accident that happened right in front of Amen. us. Amen. And that is one of the million things that God keep us safe because we were obedient and we sensitive to God's voice. That's right. God's guidance. And this is what I've been trying to encourage everybody here to make the worship the prayer spending time with him as as part of our day not just whenever we we need him or we are in trouble even whenever you are happy even every, whenever everything is going right for you praise him and pray Amen. and yes. tell him god i need a guidance i need a guidance in this decision i don't know it looks really good but I want to be in your will. It's not my will. Because it doesn't matter how good is everything in, in front of you, if it's not God's will. That's right. It still not work out. So keep doing what you're doing and just keep crying to him. And he says, Lord, I need you. That's I right. need you. And spend more yes. time and make this as a lifestyle. And I, yes. as long as you come to this church, you will hear that a lot. Amen. This as a lifestyle. Amen. And you may be seated. I was fooled. I thought we were going to do another song there for a minute. Praise the Lord. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. Good. You're still awake. That's good. Thank you. So we've been doing a little series uh, on the book of Acts, a little mini-series, um, and we have uh, did extraordinary, we did extravagant. Today we're going to do ecstatic, right? How many are ecstatic about what God's done for you, amen? Uh, how many of you have ever put your foot in your mouth? Just raise your hand if you ever put your foot in your mouth. Okay, that should be everybody, right? You said something that was uh, really ought not to have been said at the wrong time. Uh, or you said something that was really embarrassing. I, I do that often. In fact, I, I, I must like the taste of my foot because it's often there. 
Uh, Maurice Smith, in his book, Tall Tales of a Big God, tells of a really embarrassing moment that he himself went through. Uh, as an evangelist, he was uh, uh, ministering in Glasgow, and he was passing out song sheets. And he had his uh, guitarist, Dave, with him. And as he was passing out these song sheets, he, he came across this. Uh, the song sheet was for Hallelujah, right? And so he came across this lady had that charismatic sway going on. And she was smiling. You could tell she was worshiping God. And, he, and so he, he tried to give her a song sheet. And he's like, here you go. And she's like, no, no, thank you. And, and he's like, well, being persistent like most evangelists are, we're kind of pushy. He's like, no, 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 seriously, you know, go ahead. Here, take one. You'll want one. And she's like, no, 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 it's okay. Thank you. It's okay. And uh, he's like, are, are you sure you wouldn't like one? And about that time, somebody leaned over into his ear and said, uh, Maurice, she's blind. <laughs> and so he felt really, really, really awkward at that moment and kind of embarrassed. And so he reached out to Dave, his guitar, and said, play something. At which he instantly started playing, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. <laughs> so he went from feeling really embarrassed to just awful. Just totally awful. And, and it was one of those moments that the foot was in the mouth, Right. And he said that uh, in his book, he tells how the, it went right away to laughter as he looked up at the young lady and she was laughing hysterically at the both of them, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, sometimes we say things that are not necessarily the best. Uh, uh, Barbara Bush was not immune to this either. She went to Tokyo. Maybe you've heard of that country over there, you know, Japan, and she was in Tokyo having lunch with the emperor and the imperial palace and looking around at how elegant the palace was and how beautiful it was, she complimented on his, him on his official residence. He, he said, thank you. She asked, is it new? He said, yes. She said, was the other one falling down or did you just decide to build a new one? And he said, I'm sorry, you bombed it. <laughs> So, yes, it was new. <laughs> uh, and we all, like I said, have said things that, and done things that have totally embarrassed us. But, you know, one of the things we shouldn't be embarrassed about is our faith. Amen? Amen? We should not be embarrassed about our faith. We should be strong in our faith. We should be secure in our faith. We should be able to communicate our faith to all those that we meet. Uh, in fact, you know, the funny thing about it is that they call the defense of Christianity, the theology of that is called apologetics. Why do we feel like we need to apologize for our faith? I don't feel the need to apologize for my faith. I, I don't think that anybody should feel the need to apologize for their faith in Jesus Christ. Dwight Moody once wrote, I do not believe there is any false religion in the world that men are not proud of. Just think about that for a moment. He said, I don't believe there's any false religion in the world that men are not proud of. The only religion of which I've ever heard that men are ashamed of is the religion of Jesus Christ. He says, and Dwight continues, he says, some time ago, I preached two weeks in Salt Lake City, and I did not find a Mormon that was not proud of his religion. I've never met an, an unconverted Chinaman who was not proud of being a disciple of Confucius. I never met a Mohammedan who wasn't proud of the fact that he was a follower of Muhammad. But how many, many times have I found men ashamed of the religion of Jesus Christ? The only religion that gives men the power over their affections and lust and sins. If there was some back door by which men could slip into heaven, there would be a great many who would want to enter it. But they don't like to make public confession. Dwight Moody wrote that. And you think about how true that is. How true it is. Uh, the only religion, the only true religion, the only one that can save us, that change us, the only way that we can enter into heaven is by Jesus Christ. And here we have the cure for all mankind. We have the cure for all mankind. The cure for sin is within us. And yet, many of us are ashamed to share that cure. Friends, Think about this for a moment. If you possess the cure for cancer, 
Would you keep it to yourself? If you possess the cure for AIDS, would you keep it to yourself? You possess the cure for the eternity of someone's soul. Much more important than this physical body, because this physical body, if you're lucky, you may have a good hundred years on this earth. hundred years sounds like a long time, right? Until you turn 40, and then it doesn't seem so long. <laughs> when I was like 12, 30 was like old. Now that I'm like in my 40s going on to my 50s, you know, 80s singing and seeming kind of young. Uh, I'm just saying, this physical body is only here but for a brief time. It is, as someone said to me yesterday, a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. We possess the cure for the eternal soul, Jesus Christ. And yet, we're ashamed. How true is this statement today? Instead of being proud of our Savior and sharing His glory and forgiveness, we're at the point and place in our society where we're afraid to offend someone. I say we need to move from being ashamed and being apologetic for our faith to being ecstatic for our faith, to being happy for our faith, to know that we have something to share and it is great and wonderful and be willing to share it. We looked at Peter and John last week, if you were here, and we seen that they were ecstatic about their faith. And as they walked past that, that lame man who was at the temple gate, you know, they said, silver and gold have a none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. They were ecstatic. They had something to give. Amen. Think about what happened. We're, we're going to read some scripture. Uh, we're going to read quite a few verses of scripture together. I'm going to read them very quickly, so just kind of pay attention. If you want to follow along, it's fine. But I, I want to get through this passage so that we can get to the point that I want to share with you today. It's Acts chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go all the way through verse 21. Some of you are like, we'll be here forever, okay? Yeah. No, we, we won't. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read... Through this passage, it says the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Again, this is right after the, the lame man was healed. They're preaching and they're teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the number is being added to them daily. And so it says, The next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Again, they're talking about the, the man that they was healed at the temple gate called Beautiful. And it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today of an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which, was, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Understand something very quickly. This is not part of the message, but I, feel, I would feel amiss if I didn't mention it. It says that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There are not many roads leading to the same place. There is only one road leading to heaven, and that 
gatekeeper is the name and the power of Jesus Christ. We can only find relationship with God through him. Narrow is the gate. Moving right along, he says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Friends, there's power in that statement right there. Unschooled, ordinary men, people, individuals. I don't know if any of you can relate to being unschooled and ordinary. Maybe you can. Maybe you have school and you're ordinary. But nonetheless, maybe you can relate to Peter and John. And again, we talked about this already, that that it was the power of the promised Holy Spirit that came upon them that empowered them to do that which they could not do on their own, which was to stand up for Jesus. But here they are before all the leaders and all the rulers. After spending the night in jail, they come out even more bold than when they went in. A lot of us cower down. We will mention the name of Christ and we'll we'll want to testify about who he is and we'll speak up and and then we'll realize that it's not accepted and we'll cower down. And we won't let our faith shine through. Instead of being ecstatic, we're embarrassed. But it says here in this passage of Scripture, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they couldn't, It says, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Friends, when when the Lord moves through you and the Holy Spirit guides you and you speak up, the testimony that is provided by the Holy Spirit will quiet the mouth of those who are against the Spirit. So there, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Do you realize there's power in the name of Jesus? There is power In the name of Jesus. They were scared of his name. They they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Now, I I want to just talk to you a minute about this scenario. And I want us to relate and learn here. You know, they had been with Jesus and they had received the promised Holy Spirit. Friends, in and of yourself, understand this, in and of yourself, in your own power, by your own means, you can do nothing to promote Christ. If you try, you will fail. Because then you are no longer moving from relationship, you're moving out of religion. Religion can save no one. Religion has never saved anyone. But a personal relationship with Jesus Christ has led many to repentance Many to transformation, many to healing. I am changed today. I am who I am today because of a relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. Not because of a book, not because of a set of rules, not because of a bunch of do's and don'ts, but more of what I can do because of he who lives in me. Amen? Amen. That should get you excited. No one intimidated them. When the power of the promised Holy Spirit lives in you, intimidation is a thing of past. Fear didn't factor in. They were no longer concerned about today. Many of us have spent our whole lives worried about today. What am I going to do today? What am I going to eat today? Where is my money going to come from today? How am I going to get what I want today? Friends, today... Mine will be yesterday 
Because my life is secure in eternity. Do you understand that? It's not about today. It's not even about tomorrow. For me, it's about forever. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Embarrassment. There was no embarrassment. There was no intimidation. There was no fear. They spoke boldly. They had an opportunity to share, and they did. And what did they share? Did they share about how great they were? Woo, there's an anointing on me. Look at me. I can just pick up the lame man, and they can walk. No, they didn't do that, did they? No. Uh-uh. What did they talk about? What did they share? They shared Jesus. They shared the power of his name. They shared the fact that those that you, you who crucified him, he raised again. He is alive. They shared hope. Friends, we have hope for eternity because our Savior is risen. That's what they shared. Like I said, you've got the only cure for a totally fatal, eternal disease of sin. They shared. They shared openly. They shared faithfully. Now, I want to look at three things today. Okay? For those of you taking notes, we've been sticking on three points, so we're going to stick with three points. Okay? It's easy to remember three points, right? So we're going to go over three points today, and, and we're going to try to look at Peter and John, and we want to learn something from these, these uh, first century disciples of Christ. Because we know that what's happening now in our century is the same thing that's happening in their century. And we can relate to that, can't we? Can can you relate to Peter? Say amen if you can relate to Peter. Maybe some of you relate more to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Of course, he loved them all. But, you know, maybe maybe you relate more to John. I'm more like Peter. Start off on a good foot and then blow it and then have to get right again and, you know, repent. I don't know. Just I relate there. But... The first thing I want you to understand about both Peter and John, these two disciples, and this is your first point, is that they were spirit-filled. They were spirit-filled. They were spirit-filled. That's important because the reality is if we go all the way back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if you can pull it up there for me on the screen, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I think I have it there for you. Well, no, let's look at verse, let's just look at verse 8 of chapter 4 then. It says, I'll, I'll find it here. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. So we know that it says that they were filled with spirit, but Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and this is what I want you to see. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's important because they received the power for what? Come on, church, are you awake? God is good? All the time. Oh, y'all are asleep. Man, y'all must have stayed up too late last night. God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. They were spirit-filled. They received the power, and the power was to do what? Witness. To witness. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. So they were filled with the Spirit. They were totally transformed. And the reality is this. What the Spirit did for them... The Holy Spirit can do for you. Interesting thing. They went up in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, and they prayed. And they waited for what? They waited for the Holy Spirit. They waited for the promise to come. Many of us have gotten tired of waiting. We've left the upper room and we're out in society doing our own thing, wondering how come we're not walking in power. Because we failed to stay where we were supposed to stay and do the things we were supposed to do to receive the anointing of God to be filled with his presence. Amen? Well, some of y'all ain't liking this preaching. That's okay. It doesn't change the fact it's true, whether you like it or not. They were totally transformed by the Spirit. That same men that denied Christ three times upon his, Jesus' arrest, Peter, Mark tells us then, you know, was filled with the power and the presence. Luke tells us here in Acts, he was filled with power and presence. He was filled with the Spirit. You and I both can be filled with the Spirit. 
These same men, just follow me for a minute. The book of Mark tells us these same men that were in the upper room praying and waiting on the promised Holy Spirit that now have been moved as the unstoppable church. These same men, Mark tells us, fled. Fled so quickly that one of them even left his garment and fled naked. That's how, how scared they were of being arrested. That's how ashamed of the gospel they were. But when the power of the promised Holy Spirit entered them, the shame left. That's what happened at Pentecost, and that's what can happen for us. Do you need the power? Yeah. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody, I got the power. I got the power. Man, for people who got the power, y'all don't seem very excited about it. The Holy Spirit lives in here. I got the power. There is nothing I have need of, nothing I have, I have want of that's in his will that I don't have. If I need it and he wants me to have it, guess what I got? Whatever it is, I got it. Amen? Got the power. They were spirit-filled. <laughs> we're not called to run and hide. We're not called to be quiet. Friends, we, we, when, we, when we come to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, he doesn't take us up to be to heaven with him. He leaves us here as witnesses. He leaves us here with the promised Holy Spirit to guide us as a witness. Acts 17.6 states that, uh, that these gentlemen were known for turning the world upside down down <laughs> friends we need to turn our world from upside down to right side up <laughs> okay because <laughs> things are amiss today Amen. okay we need to be one that are world changers yeah. it needs to be said about you and I that when we enter anywhere and do anything that the entire atmosphere changes amen, amen. point number two these disciples preach Jesus unashamedly. They were not ashamed of the gospel. They were not ashamed of who Jesus is in their life and what he had done for them and what he would do for them. His name alone turns the world upside down. We already know that in our society, you can talk about God, you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Muhammad, you can talk about Confucius, you can talk about any other higher power that you want to, and it's okay. But the minute you begin to mention the name of Jesus, the world can't stand it. In fact, in 2001, when Franklin Graham ended his inauguration prayer over George Bush, he said these words, We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Lord Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Within days, a lawsuit had been filed against President Bush for Graham's prayer, alleging that it was unconstitutional to endorse any religion. People were completely outraged that Graham invoked the name of Jesus. Listen. For 2,000 years, the name of Jesus has been transforming lives. Come on now. For 2,000 years, alcoholics have been getting sober because of the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Drug addicts have laid down whatever substance they've been holding on to for, because of the name of Jesus. Prostitutes have gotten cleansed and renewed because of the name of Jesus. Sinners have gotten saved because of the name of Jesus. This old person and who I used to be has been totally renewed and changed because of the name of Jesus. And it is that name that can change you. Now, I had a conversation with a group of individuals today. They've been asking for some change. And somebody told them that maybe they didn't need to change that particular situation. What maybe needed to change was their attitude on it. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Friends, some of y'all are praying for things that you want God to do. And it isn't God's will for your life. Some of you are seeking to, to, to make things happen that God don't want to happen. And you want to know how come you're bumping up against a brick wall? Because he loves you. Even Jesus prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen? They unashamedly preached the name of Jesus. Every other religion on earth has one thing in common. Their founder is dead. Come on. Every other religion on earth has one thing in common. Its founder is dead. Friends, I want to tell you something about Christianity, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. My Savior is alive. He got up from the grave. He laid down his life that my sins could be forgiven. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father making petition for me. For you. I don't have a, a, a dead founder of religion. I got a live and well brother who's making petition on my behalf so I can be adopted into the kingdom and have relationship with God. That's why we boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Jesus. Doesn't it just feel good? Yeah. Friends, I want to encourage you. When you're struggling, start saying Jesus. Start calling out to Jesus. When the enemy's attacking and things aren't going right, call on the name that has the power to change it. Amen? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. 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 Man, that just feels good. We need a kitchen. <laughs> Hallelujah. For those who don't know, Mikey is praying for a kitchen for Promised Land. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Third point. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Y'all think, oh, he might finish on time. Who knows? <clears throat> they were filled with the Spirit. They unashamedly preached the name of Jesus. Third point. They were Bible preachers. Amen. They preached the Word of God. They didn't even have the Bible back then, Glenn. How did they preach the Bible? Oh, yes, they did. They had the Old Testament. Oh, yes, they did. They had God's Word. And they were in the process of giving us the rest of God's Word. Amen? Amen. They were Bible preachers. The final point I want to make for you today is that these disciples not only preached Jesus, but they preached God's Word as well. Even in this passage, they quote Psalms. Even in the passage we, we read, they, they, they quoted Psalms. Uh, every time the apostles opened their mouth to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, huge chunks of Scripture came flowing out. They preached the Word. Now, why is this so important? You know, maybe you don't get it because maybe this is the only experience you've had with church, and, and we really stick with the Bible here, you know. You won't come to a message here or a sermon here and not hear Scripture being read, okay? But there are churches that meet every Sunday, and they just talk about things, about current issues, which isn't bad. They talk about, um, you know, what's happening. They talk about their interpretation of Scripture, but they fail to go to the Word of God. That's not right. The apostles, the disciples, preached the Bible. They preached the Word of God. 
And we need to unashamedly preach the word of God. In fact, it's all too often that we as individuals, as well as other churches and other people that, you know, promote themselves as religious, interpret scripture to meet and follow what they want to do. If you've ever been guilty about interpreting a scripture to make it okay to do what you want to do, raise your hand. Go ahead. Come on now. Be honest. Honesty. Don't lie in church. Lightning may come. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, we've all done it. We want to do something and we try to find a scripture in the Bible that we can take out of context, reread it this way or that way, interpret it how we want to, to make it okay to do what we want to do. Okay. Now, St. Augustine says, and he was right when he said it, he says, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. Can I share with you something? The best of my thinking has only got me in trouble. Amen? Amen? Amen. I thought my wife would be the loudest one on that, Tony, but I appreciate you for that, okay? Yeah, the, my best thinking usually gets me in the worst trouble. But when I'm obedient to God, I'm not going to say that there isn't some opposition, because there's always opposition when you're obedient to God. I'm not going to say that it's a trouble-free philosophy. It's no akuna matata or anything like that, okay? But... It is right. And when you obey God and you're obedient to him, you'll be amazed at what God can do in you. Friends, he gave us his word. You know, I have people meet me in the office all the time that say, I don't know what God wants for me. And I ask them, have you read his word? No. Well, no wonder you don't know what he wants for you. It's pretty self-explanatory if you begin to study it, if you begin to read it, and if you actually begin to apply it. You know what God wants for you. The reason why you don't know what God wants for you is because you want something different than what God wants for you. And you're trying to justify what you want over what He wants. Let me in, let, you, let you in on just a little secret here. One day, every single one of us will die. Unless the good Lord comes back first and then we're still going to heaven either way. And one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And one day, we're going to be sitting up there at those pearly gates and the roll is going to be called up yonder. And at that moment, right there, When they're checking to see if your name is in the Lamb's book of life. Whether or not you accepted Christ as your Savior. Let me in. This is the secret I want you to know. Nothing you own. Nothing you amassed. Nothing you had a title on. Nothing you accomplished in this physical life is going to make a hill of beans at that moment. You could say, I was a good daddy. I sent my kids to college. You could say anything you want to say, but it isn't going to make a bit of difference on that day. The only thing that's going to make a bit of difference on that day is if you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. On that day, Having accepted him is the only thing that matters. As the praise team comes and we get ready to close, I I want to continue to, to share with you. Many of you are 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 sitting here right now and you're thinking, I said the sinner's prayer when I was eight years old. I walked that aisle when that preacher called and and, and I repeated those words and, and, and I'm okay. 
But you're arguing with yourself right now. Because the Holy Spirit that's in this room is telling you that you may have said some words, but your life never changed. And I want to tell you that a saved life is a changed life. As we're talking about the power that is in the name of Jesus, as we're talking about the power that's in the spirit, as we're talking about the power that's in the word of God, it will change your life. And what will be important is how you live for him. Not for salvation, but because he gave his life for you. Because he laid everything down for you, you'll want to lay everything down for him. I was raised in church. Both of my grandfathers were Southern Baptist ministers. One's name was Glenn, one name was Melvin, and they named me Glenn Melvin. I ain't had no choice, amen? But I'm going to be honest with you. Although I walked that aisle as a young man, it didn't change my life. Although I, I, I accepted Christ as my Savior and, 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 and I began to make a change, but I fell off at, at when I was in eighth grade. It wasn't until I was an adult. And I was standing at that river down at Sop Choppy City Park. And I had personally and privately rededicated my life to the Lord. But I was ashamed to stand up and tell people that I hadn't been right. I was afraid they would know. Can I let you know a little secret? They already knew. I was the only one that was fooled. <laughs> but that, that pastor was there and he, and he said to me, he said, might as well have been me, to everyone there's anyone here that needs to get their baptism in order these waters are open for you and I found myself throwing my wallet on the ground and kicking my shoes off and putting my cell phone on the ground and and, and walking out in that water fully clothed with no change of clothes no towel no nothing but I didn't care because I knew I had to get right with him today I want to I want to lay out that same opportunity for you no, we're not doing baptisms right this minute, but today, instead of being ashamed, today, instead of holding on to something you did 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, today make a choice to serve Him. Today make a choice to not be ashamed, to get ecstatic about the one who saved you. And as this altar gets ready to open and the altar team joins me, I want you to know there's power in his name power in his name whatever you need he has it today stand with me father we thank you we praise you we ask lord god that you will pour out an anointing of fire in this place lord that your holiness would call us to you Lord, we don't want to play games anymore. We don't want to stand on yesterday's words. We want to walk in power with you. Guide us, direct us, and allow your anointing to flow. In Jesus' name, the altar is open. Will you come?